All right. Uh, Before we get into the message today, I realized this week that it's been quite a while since we did something as a congregation. And uh, some of you maybe haven't done this before. It's called a leap for joy. Now, the idea here is that no matter what's going on in our lives, God's Word tells us that there's always reason to rejoice because of who He is and what He's done and what He's going to do. And so the leap for joy, it's a physical practice. There's no magic in it, but it's kind of like preaching to your own soul, like saying, why are you downcast, soul? Rejoice in the Lord. And so what happens is I count to three, and then everybody jumps up in the air, feet off the ground, One hand, two hands in the air, I don't care, and you just yell, praise God, or woo-hoo, okay? I think we can do that, so everybody stand up. A few weeks ago, I, uh, I was having a particularly rough day, wasn't doing super great, and I went for a walk, and uh, I get a message from my wife, and I open it up, and it's a video of my four little kids doing a leap for joy in their bedroom um, because they were praying for dad's heart. Uh, we're going to be taking a break from our journey through Romans until after Easter, and then we're going to be getting into chapter 3. But for now, God laid a message on my heart this week, and I have confidence that as we surrender and place our eyes on Him, we're going to find encouragement this morning. But before we get there, I want to share a story with you. It's one I've shared before. It's a story that seems worthy of repeating And I'm sure that many of you have heard at least some variation of it before. So travel back in time with me. The Civil War had ended. There was lots of economic growth and business was booming in Chicago. The character of our story is Horatio G. Spafford. He was a Presbyterian church elder and a respected attorney and real estate investor. In 1871, the Great Chicago Fire consumed much of the city, and Horatio lost a large fortune. Around the same time, his four-year-old son, Horatio Spafford Jr., died of scarlet fever. Horatio stayed and helped to rebuild Chicago, but in 1873, he decided to take his wife and daughters and head to Europe. His friend, D.L. Moody, was preaching at meetings in England that Horatio had planned to attend as he would begin a vacation. Right before the family was going to embark on their trip, Horatio was detained for an urgent business matter in New York. So he sent his family ahead of him on a luxurious ship. Late one night in November 1873, the ship collided with another vessel. The ship was filled with water and the terrified screams of the passengers. The ship disappeared into the deep, and 226 fatalities were recorded, including Horatio's four daughters, Annie, Maggie, Bessie, and Tanetta. His wife, Anna, was found clinging to a piece of debris. I looked at my wife right as I was reading this. (laughs) Uh... His wife, Anna, was found clinging to a piece of debris, barely conscious. Forty-seven survivors made it to shore, and Anna sent word to Horatio, saying, Saved alone. Upon receiving the news, Horatio chartered passage on a ship to go join his wife. One cold December night, the captain beckoned Horatio and told him that they were now passing over the area where the ship carrying his daughters, went down. Horatio retreated to his cabin, full of sorrow and despair. And it was there in that room, 
late at night, with a broken heart and downcast soul, that God ministered to Horatio's heart, and he penned the words, It is well, the will of God be done. Later on, he used those words from that night to write the hymn, It is well with my soul. This morning, I want to spend some time thinking about comfort, hope, and peace. And please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14, 1 to 6. You know, there's lots of passages in Scripture that talk about God being very near and ever-present help, uh, being with us and not leaving us or forsaking us. He's our healer, our comforter. And those are beautiful truths, but we're going to take a bit of a different focus today. John 14, 1 to 6. And I ask that if you're able, you would stand with me as we read God's Word. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the precious gift of your word and this time together in it. We pray that you would give us understanding that your Holy Spirit would take your living and active word and plant it in our hearts, bring us conviction, bring us encouragement. And Lord, help us, give us eyes to see, give us faith to believe. Lord, we need you. Remove anything in me that would be a distraction or a hindrance for anyone. Lord, you preach your truth to us, your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's likely today that many of you are feeling burdened. You're exhausted. You're looking for the end to any number of difficulties. And if you're doing well today, then praise God. I'm thankful for that. But there's a good chance that there have been moments this week, this month, or this decade where turmoil would be a good way to describe your feelings. And those times are likely to come again in this world. If we're honest, there's times where all of us go through some kind of agony. Times where we lose hope. Times where we give up or feel like giving up. Our peace is gone. We've been robbed or we've robbed ourselves. If I was to ask you if it is well with your soul, what would you say? If today you would say yes, well, again, praise God, we can be thankful for that, but what about all those other moments? What if today after church your house flooded, or your car caught fire, or there was a medical emergency, or in an instant you lost all your children, as happened to Horatio Spafford? Can you imagine not only losing a great deal of wealth, Then all of your daughters, after already losing your only son, and then reading the words, saved alone, and being out on the water and being informed that you're now in the area where your beloved daughters had drowned. Tough times like these come, don't they? Many of us have walked through some serious tragedy and sorrow. Some of us have had multiple things all seem to stack up at once. And some of you are walking through seasons of life like that right now. You're wrestling with suicidal thoughts. You're fighting with your spouse. You've lost your job. Your child is sick. Your spouse is dying. You're struggling with a difficult diagnosis. Or you've had yet another miscarriage. 
And a list like this hardly even covers all the different ways that people in this church are suffering right now. My heart's broken over the struggles and the suffering. I see it, hear it, and feel it locally and abroad. Life is hard. And for some, the statement, life's hard, is offensive because it feels like that doesn't even begin to cover it. Hard seems to utterly fail to describe the agony and the struggle. And so I have to ask, what do we do about this? When our souls are burdened, when we can't seem to contain the tears, when we can barely muster the strength to get out of bed and stand up. Is it really possible for someone to go through the great tragedies of this life and be able to say like Job, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Or like Horatio Spafford, it is well, the will of God be done. Is this really possible? Is it even acceptable? I don't know where you're at this morning. If you're a Christian or if you hate God or you're somewhere in between, I don't know if you're feeling hopeless or helpless or undeserving of love. I don't know what each individual person is feeling this morning, but I know that everyone is hungry for grace and peace and hope. And so this morning, being faced with very real lives, with very real battles, it is not enough for me to stand up here and to utter shallow platitudes or to tell you nice and fluffy things that I hope are true while having no real belief. You and I need truth. When we ask if there's any real hope to be found, we need a firm foundation to run to. We need truth that doesn't change, love without conditions, mercy that's new each day, and grace that's overwhelmingly abundant. We need hope that's steadfast and sure. And so we come to the place where truth and hope are found. Not in the vain ramblings and speculations of men, but the Word of God. And this passage, John 14, 1 to 6, it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture, especially for funerals. On November 4th, 2017, I stood up in front of four or 500 people to speak at a funeral for the first time. The funeral was for my grandpa, and as I was trying to think of what to say to all these people, so many people who who don't know God, trying to think of what words I could offer my grandma and other family and friends who were present, this passage is the one that God orchestrated for me to speak from. It's a perfect passage for communicating hope to those who are hurting. As we go through this passage, there's three things that I'm highlighting for our attention today, and these three things are truths upon which we can anchor ourselves in the storms of life. As we learn to say, as Spafford did, it is well with my soul. So number one, we must believe in God. We must believe in God. Verse 1 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. This passage is part of the conversation between Jesus and his disciples after the Last Supper. In chapter 13, we see that Jesus washed the disciples' feet, called out the betrayal of Judas, gave the disciples the commandments to love one another, and he said to them, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And we can look back at this story and we can see that in chapter 13, Jesus was talking about the disciples joining him later in heaven. However, it seems like the disciples weren't really thinking of a future in heaven, but were instead focusing on the fact that Jesus was going to be leaving them. We see Jesus say, let not your hearts be troubled. I find it interesting that Jesus gave these words to the disciples. 
We don't know for certain if they were physically or verbally expressing anxiety at the moment, if Jesus saw fear in their hearts, or if he was cautioning them against the fear or anxiety that was yet to come. Maybe all of the above. J.C. Ryle said, We have first in this passage a precious remedy against an old disease. That disease is trouble of heart. That remedy is faith. Heart trouble is the commonest thing in the world. No rank, class, or condition is exempt from it. No bars or bolts or locks can keep it out. Partly from inward causes and partly from outward. Partly from the body and partly from the mind. Partly from what we love and partly from what we fear. The journey of life is full of trouble. Even the best of Christians have many bitter cups to drink between grace and glory. Even the holiest of saints finds the world A veil of tears. Jesus was instructing his disciples not to get worked up over difficulty or sorrow. Instead, he offers them something else to occupy their thoughts and attention. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is saying when the storms of life come, when you're getting worked up, when your hearts are becoming troubled, hope in him, trust in him, put your faith in him, believe in him. And perhaps your natural mind responds to this idea the same way mine often does when in the midst of agony. Yeah, that's a nice idea, but it's not practical. Or I've tried that, but it's not fixing things or any other number of objections that our minds are quick to spew out and cling to. But I assure you that there's a power-filled, truth-soaked, life-changing message here from Jesus. If we just have the ears to hear and faith to believe. Now this is the essence of our response to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We see belief is the only element of our salvation that we actually play a role in. And through studying Scripture, we understand that we can't even really do that on our own. We don't save ourselves. We don't do anything to earn salvation. All we do, all we're called to do, is believe in Jesus. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.36a, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. 5.24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Just in these few verses, we catch a glimpse of the beauty of the salvation that God has made available to all those who believe. And we need to understand that apart from the salvation found in Jesus, we won't experience the peace or power or hope that Jesus offers in this passage. We need him. Don't lose sight of that. Interestingly, this belief that Jesus is calling his disciples to isn't just simply an affirmation of a truth. He isn't just telling them to believe that he exists or to acknowledge the work that he's done or even just acknowledge that he's the Messiah. The belief that Jesus calls his disciples to here is action. We must actively believe and our active belief must cause us to act. In other words, our reality, how we think, how we behave has to be altered by what we believe. In this case, specifically our belief in Jesus. And so with a change to our thoughts and our hearts, our active belief changes the way that we live. Our lives look different. This is part of that regenerative work of salvation where we are made to be new creatures, new creations. Our active believing calls us to Take every thought captive to put to death the deeds of the flesh, to walk in the Spirit, to praise God in our difficulties, to leap 
for joy when we're falsely accused, when we're downcast, to trust Him when things seem hopeless, and to strive after submission and obedience to God and His Word. In our text, Jesus is calling us to trust Him. He's calling us to anchor ourselves in who He is, what He's done, and what He'll do. It's similar to what we see in John 16, when Jesus said, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Be encouraged. Jesus doesn't leave us on our own. He doesn't offer salvation and freedom and then just abandon us. He's always watching, always working, always interceding, standing in the gap between God and man. We're told he's seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. It's an incredible picture. And he's calling us to believe, to act, to live in belief. And so when our hearts are troubled, we are able to say, it is well with my soul because we have a Lord and Savior to believe in. Number two, God has promised and he doesn't lie. God has promised and he doesn't lie. Verses two to four say, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Have you ever looked at the thousands of promises in the Bible? Have you ever tried to study that out and see which ones actually apply to you? God has promised so many things to us. And it's amazing because we can have total confidence in his promises coming true. It's not a guess. It's not a a vain, absent hope. The way we hope the weather will be nice tomorrow. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? In our passage today, Jesus reminds his disciples that part of believing in him is also believing his promises and trusting that he'll do what he said he'll do. And of all God's promises, this one in our text, it's one of great detail and beauty. Jesus speaks of heaven and the presence of God. He tells his disciples that when he returns to heaven, he'll be preparing a place for each and every one. This is personal and specific. He's preparing a place for you. It's intimate and caring. Really, it's mind-boggling. Who am I that the God of the universe would prepare a place for me? And then he continues to say that he will definitely return to get all of his disciples. So that includes you if you've found salvation in Christ. Sometimes... We distort the character of God because we try to view God through the lens of the other relationships in our life. And people in your life may have abandoned and mistreated you. He won't. Your parents and friends may have forgotten you. He won't. Others may have failed to keep their promises to you, and certainly people have. He won't. People may have stopped loving you and erased any plans for your future together. He won't. To me, this is one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Isn't that glorious? 
that Jesus will take his disciples to be with him. He's not just going to send believers to live in some beautiful places that he's prepared, but he's going to take believers to be with him. And if you're a Christian, then this is God's promise to you. He's preparing a place for you, he will return for you, and he will take you to be with him. When the difficulties of life come and our hearts are troubled, we can focus on God's beautiful promises and declare, it is well with my soul, not because the problems magically disappear, but because there's a promise that will be fulfilled. You can bank your life on it, you can bank eternity on it. And number three, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Look at verses five to six. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, in our lives, it's easy to wonder where we're going, what's going on around us, and why things are happening. Those are questions we hear a lot today, especially when trials and difficulties come. The disciples in this story are human. They struggle just like we do. They're relatable. They struggle to understand. They struggle to believe. And we can find many stories where they didn't really seem to understand what Jesus was saying or what was going on around them. And this story is no exception. Jesus was speaking of eternal things and the disciples didn't get it. When Jesus responds to Thomas's query by referring to himself in three glorious names, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And J.C. Ryle said, the fullness of these precious words can probably never be taken in by man. He that attempts to unfold them does little more than scratch the surface of a rich soil. And I have to agree with Ryle. And so today I stand here as one who attempts to scratch the surface so that we can catch just a glimpse of our Savior and the significance of this passage. We see a similarity here to Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now John very generously gives us many I am statements of Jesus. John 6.35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. 8.12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 10.7, so Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 11.25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. 15.1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And 8.58, relating back to Exodus, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. All of these passages are ways that Jesus revealed the truth about who he was to the world around him. And I would argue that all of these other I am statements could be summed up in the statement found in verse 6 of our text. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way to heaven and peace with God. He's the way to salvation and redemption. He is the teacher, the guide, the lawgiver. And as we saw on that list of verses, he's also the gate, the door, and the light. Ephesians 3.12 says, In whom, talking of Jesus, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. Access, boldness, confidence. Likewise, He's the truth. 
He's the entirety of true religion and life-altering truth. He's the one who never lies and never changes, the one who's faithful and always keeps his promises. Without Christ, even the wisest person on earth would be missing real truth, and they would be totally incapable of becoming right with God. And so the wisdom is empty, it's vain. And he's the life, the fullness of life exists only in Christ. No matter how hard YouTube and TikTok try to convince us otherwise, the fullness of life exists only in Christ. Only in Jesus can we gain new life and find life everlasting. Now Jesus even goes on to say that life is found exclusively in him. That's an offensive statement, a divisive statement. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not only is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life, but he's exclusively these things. He's the almighty truth, and he's the only way to everlasting and redeemed life. You can't believe in all sorts of different religions. You can't put your trust in your own works and effort. You can't follow Buddha, pray to Allah, trust in Mary, or pursue enlightenment through yoga. Not all roads lead to God. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. It doesn't matter how rich, attractive, clever, educated, strong, fast, charitable, kind-hearted, energetic, or polite you are. You cannot find salvation apart from Jesus. He is the path, the door, the gate. And on the flip side, it doesn't matter how sinful, wretched, messed up, unlovable, or heinous you may be. There's no one too far gone for the grace of God. You can still find hope. You can still find salvation and be made into a new creation in Christ Jesus. The most righteous saint is no less in need of Jesus than the most despicable sinner. And so, if you're feeling too far gone this morning, you need to know that you're wrong. We're all in need of a Savior, but not all of us acknowledge our need. We're all in need of forgiveness, but not all of us repent. We're all in need of redemption, but not all of us surrender. But the truth is, Without God, we're destined for death and hell. We're hopeless and helpless. But if we believe in Jesus Christ and surrender our lives to Him, He has promised, and remember we can trust those, He's promised to forgive us, cleanse us, guide us, and guard us. If you're feeling confused or don't know where things are going in your life, Jesus is the way. If you're struggling to discover what's correct or you're not really sure what's happening, Jesus is the truth. If you're lacking peace, hope, joy, and comfort, or you know that you're destined for death, Jesus is the life. He's done all that's required for your salvation. He's done all the work that you could never do. He's paid the price that we could never pay. He's lifted us up when we could never lift ourselves, and he continues to work. He continues to heal and protect and to strengthen. And so, when the difficulties of life come and our hearts are troubled, we can focus on who Christ is and declare, it is well with my soul because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And dear people, Jesus is the person in whom we can believe wholeheartedly. He's provided promises that will be fulfilled through his work. They don't depend on us. And he's the pathway through which we find redemption. 
Whenever we lack courage, whenever we're disheartened, whenever we're feeling lost or alone, we have a mighty Savior who is the way, the truth, and the life. So Houston Baptist Church, is it well with your soul? Is it well with your soul? Whenever you feel discouraged, whenever your heart is troubled, take heart. Be encouraged. Believe in God. Believe in who He is. See what He's done for you and the promises He has for you. Remember His words, I will come again and I will take you to Myself, that where I am you may be also. Look to Jesus. Remember His faithfulness. And believe in Him so that it, when it feels like the weight of this world is crushing you, you can say, my God is the way, the truth, and the life. He's prepared a place for me. He's going to come again for me and take me to be with Him. And because of who He is, what He's done, and what I know He will do, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness, for your mercy and your grace. Oh, don't let us be deceived into thinking that we are great and we're better than others to judge other people and, and to put them down. Lord, we are so in need of you. And thank you that you are there. You are ever-present. You are watching and listening and waiting and you do act. That you are the living God. And that your word is living and active. That your Holy Spirit was sent to dwell among us and in us. And so we can be empowered to do the things you've called us to do. To live the impossible lives that you've called us to. Because we can do anything through you. And Lord, this morning, if there's anyone who doesn't know you, I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that you would show them their need for you, that you would remove their pride, the confusion, that you would remove the blinders that your word tells us have been placed on them by the prince of the power of the air of this present age. That light would shine into their souls. Lord, that they would throw themselves on you and believe in you. And Lord, for those of us who have done that, who are your children, God, thank you that you've written our names in your book of life. That you are the one who does the work and that even, even now, we have to depend on you. We have to trust in you. We need you, Lord. We need you every hour, every minute. Thank you for your great faithfulness, Lord. And thank you that in the most difficult of times, if we look to you, if we cast our eyes on you, if we open your word and allow your spirit to minister to our hearts, we will be able to declare it is well with my soul. Though the mountains be moved into the sea, whether we rot in a jail cell or get shipwrecked or we're getting whipped and beaten or hung on a cross, we can praise you and say it as well with my soul. Lord, make us people like that. Grow us and strengthen us here, this church, we pray. Amen.